Super. Uh, thanks so much, Steve, Sophia, Brian. Um, uh, re really exciting day for, for those of us. Um, Gabrielle and, and myself will be talking in this session. I guess we, we feel like we've been working on Firefly in some way, shape or form. Um, the, the, the code DNA, the, the trail is um, over three years long for us. Um, the, the, there has been a huge amount of activity recently, um, as, as you'll see, focused on what does it take for a project to go from um, solving individual fantastically you know, accelerating problems for uh, customers that we've been working with directly to being an open community that, that really, really works for. All. But, but actually, what you're what you're running on when you when you actually try Firefly is um, code that is based on what's in production for real real customers. It, 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 it's it, it, it's kind of us trying to take everything we've learned and distill it in a way that it's not um, it, it, it's it's able to be used by by everybody. Um, so that's really exciting for us as engineers. Um, you know, we're, we're so passionate um, uh, about open source. Uh, we use it every day. Um, so it's really exciting to be talking to you all today about the architecture of what we really hope is going to be um, a project that, that can help multi-party systems go many times faster than they have across many more industries across many more projects than, than if everybody continues to do everything sort of from the plumbing coming up. So with no, no more um, uh, ado, let me, let me um, start to drill, drill down um, a little bit. Uh, to, to do that, I am going to start by, by zooming back out to a couple of the things and recapping just for a couple of minutes on a couple of the points that were made uh, made earlier by Steve um, and um, and by uh, Severe actually, because I'm going to start going to start talking about um, from a technical person's perspective. This this slide really resonates with me from what we've seen in the industry. Um, th th this this feeling that when you come to a blockchain project, the thing that matters most and it is the kernel, it's the beating heart, it's the thing that makes your project different to all of those other enterprise projects that have come before. It, it, it's that smart contract code, right? That critically important piece of, of, of code that you're probably going to be reusing and building upon something that, that came from others. There's this feeling when you start a project that it's about that. That's because it's the most important piece of the puzzle, it's the linchpin, the project as a whole is going to be about it. And, if, and once we get that right, we're, we're golden, right? Once we've, we've built that smart contract, we've got it audited, we've deployed it, we're, we're, we're sorted. You know, it's, it's there in chain code in Fabric, or it's there in Solidity in, in, um, uh, in Ethereum, or it's there inside of a core app, right? We're, we're, we're good. Um, but, but actually, the, this middle column, it is so true. Um, what we're doing in these multi-party systems, what anybody who's lived this knows, is you're trying to bridge sophisticated, decades-old IT organizations together. You're trying to bridge together core systems that perform the most important transaction processing inside of a large enterprise that's been around for a hundred years, and you're trying to do that in a, a an atmosphere of cooperation. Right, the reason why these projects are so valuable, building these ecosystems, is so valuable, is because you're building ecosystems not just with your supply chain or not just with your um, your customers and partners. You're actually building these as an industry with your competitors as well. So, so things get complicated. Um, data, right? D data is, in an enterprise context, by default, private, sensitive, regulated, probably comes under things like right to, um, to forget to, and right to get uh, to be deleted legal legislation. That means you need to be able to prove who you sent it to 
and everybody involved in that chain needs to be able to prove that they can delete it. Some of the data you may only be able to keep for a short period of time. Some of the data may be extremely sensitive. The transactions that you're performing, the fact that you're performing them with the people that you're performing with them with is itself really sensitive. And actually, um, in an enterprise context, the, um, the, the things that you would do if you were just building something completely, completely designed for, you know, uh, end user to end user um, a de decentralized um, blockchain programming, it, it's not exactly the same thing that you do in a in in an enterprise um, consortium. So, so actually, what you end up doing is worrying about well, how do I integrate with my core systems? What's this data going to look like? What is the tiny nugget that can go on chain? Where can we use the blockchain to the greatest effect? Is it is it having a complete unique instance of something like a like a legal co a contract or a document or something at the nft space is it um is it well actually we're going to incentivize the transactions and we're going to introduce um, tokens and those kinds of things is it actually proving who said what to whom in what order in order to build on top of that a business process and and actually that becomes the job all of the surrounding infrastructure um, and and we've we've seen it done. Um, we've been part of doing it. We've been part of trying to help projects that have got a few years in and, and struggled. Um, and we've got all of this experience that we just this community is about sharing that, coming together with um, the practitioners that are in blockchain, the practitioners that aren't in blockchain and have to use this thing, the integrators the app developers, the mobile and UI beautiful experience builders coming together to get to where the job ought to be. Let's decide what the business problem is we're trying to solve. Let's work out what our canonical data formats are. Let's work out how we're going to share data. Let's work out the sequence of events that we agree has to be true. And in an enterprise context, let's work out where everybody can do things differently. Because in reality, there's going to be non-deterministic human processing. There's going to be really like business specialist developed over many years, unique proprietary business processes that are your enterprise's secret source. You're not going to give them up just because you're joining a collaborative ecosystem. Right? Work out how those interlock. And let's get to the point that we can build these in weeks and months across industries, create ecosystems where use cases can be built, trials thrown away. And you're not talking about ridiculous amounts of investment of time and engineering and pressure in terms of project deliveries can be can be met and exceeded with great user experience. That's where we want to get to. So that's all very grand. Right. Um, so what what are we actually what have we got? What what is. You know, I know that's what we really want to focus on in this part of the session. What is this this technology, and what makes it different to a blockchain? How does it work with blockchain? How does it work with other multi-body system technologies like compute, like CKPs and trusted compute, etc.? What is what is it at its at its core? And and um, in in the previous session, we 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 talked about that's a. Um, a Firefly node is like a microservices architecture in its own right. It's a pluggable system where you run for your organization a mixture of technologies. You run a blockchain node, obviously, but you also, you've got a private database that's pre-integrated with this, indexed, fast, gives you your view of the network, which is by definition in any enterprise context can be different to anyone else's view in the network. And that's not some strange database technology that you can't use. That's pluggable. That's your core SQL database, right? That's just integrated with your enterprise context. You've then got messaging, events, those off-chain transfer technologies that we all know um, as a pluggable service. And today you'll be using one. Gabrielle's going to talk you through the technologies you're going to be using today in the lab. And you'll be using a very straightforward one. But that, again, is pluggable so that you can plug in your MQP-based system if that's ActiveMQ Artemis, if, if that's um, 
uh, you know, your core enterprise system, your, your TIPCO, IBM um, messaging bus, whatever it is, right? That's, that plug point is there in the system to be able to, to, to integrate that between the members because these, are, these ecosystems are just as much about sharing private data as they are about sharing the, um, the, the on-chain transactions. Um, as part of the system. So how does an architecture from a technical level support that? Well, in the modern world, it does it through um, modern dockerized microservices architecture. And um, that is something that takes really deliberate thought, it takes really deliberate thought. And it's probably the biggest thing that we've been focused on in seeding the community is getting that plugin system right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna now really start going to a bit more a bit more depth, and we're gonna we're gonna drill into what we kind of call the periodic table of elements inside of inside of Firefly, and we're gonna start looking at some of the architecture pictures which are available um, all as part of the open community, and I'll show you where to go and find them afterwards. And you know, come to the come to the biweekly uh, meetings that you'll be hearing about in the community session later engage with this architecture push on it throw the rocks let's make it in pluggable in the way that it needs to be needs to be pluggable so um starting from this picture let's talk about what a node is right it has some it has a core okay the core is written in golang for the latest generation we actually had a previous core um, that's being being used in a lot of a lot of projects, um, uh, which we've open sourced. It's there in the in the repository, and that was TypeScript previously. And we made the deliberate decision as part of seeding this that we thought um, a Go pluggable architecture was what was needed for the kind of the kind of um, um, problems that are being solved with this with this technology. So this this core is responsible for orchestration. Right, it's it's responsible for plugging things together. Um, so it has an orchestration tier. It has an API that it services um, services externally, which is what your applications connect to. Um, and then it has the core the core components inside of there that orchestrate the big things that are done in multi-party systems. Expect to see these get added to over time. Andrew was showing um, one of we, the most important patterns, data, data management, broadcast and private transfer of, of data. Um, and we're working at the moment on bringing from the first generation to the second generation asset management, integrating those fungible and non-fungible tokens. So get involved in that architecture conversation, but Jim Zhang, who can't be here today, but is critical member of our um, uh, of our community here is leading the um, is leading the drive of getting the wide architecture together for plugging tokens both nfts and value transfer um, into this things like delivery versus payment right so that's a, a core responsibility it's sort of one of the patterns that at the front of this you get an api that as a developer you can use in those 10 lines of code that andrew showed you right you're, you're there you're working you've got that pattern working for you, um, those are exposed externally. And then the, the, the legs of the swan swimming underneath are the connectors, which are microservice runtimes that connect to the backend core infrastructure. And we made a very deliberate decision. I'm gonna drill down a layer at this point. We made a very deliberate decision in the um, formation of the plugin architecture to make it microservices based. And this was actually driven by um, a real world practical necessity. So the core is Golang. And inside of there, we have a whole bunch of um, very small shims. At the moment, these are actually compiled into the, 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 the framework because of the stage that Golang is at with, um, with library um, plugins, but they're built so that um, as, as the project evolves and as, and as Golang evolves, these will actually be able to be able to move to being completely independently built um, um, bits, of, bits of Go. But they're also very small bits of Go that run inside of the core. They're just shins. They, they conform to an interface in Go 
which allows them to be initialized with a configuration that's standardized as part of the core to be able to advertise what capabilities they do or they don't provide within the bucket that they're in. If they were public storage plugin like IPFS or they were blocking a blockchain plugin like um, like like Basu or or um, Fabric or or Corda or they're a database plugin like Postgres or MySQL um, uh, um, <clears throat> or MySQL implementation like Couch or, um, or MongoDB. That then um, there's bi-directional, uh, uh, you know, uh, data that can go in either direction, right? Actions can happen through that and events can come back. And this plugin interface um, allows any transport to be used into and out of, in and out of this, this Golang shim. And then the connectors themselves can be written in any language. They run separately. They can have a different HA model to the core Firefly um, HA model, which is what you'd expect, active-active, database-backed, highly resilient, um, modern, minimum-free deployment architecture for the core. Well, that's really hard for some of the things that might be doing done in some of these connectors. Event management, for example, is very hard to do in, in that sort of N-way scaled kind of, um, kind of way. So, so these can have a different HA model, but really importantly, it can also be written in a completely different language. So today, you're actually going to be using connectors that are that um, involve a TypeScript Node.js connector is going to be one of the connectors you're using for the private data exchange. And that's embraced. And it's actually necessary when you look at the different communities. So um, Corda, for example, is a Java-centric community. The native uh, um, uh, RPC interface for Corda is Java serialization of objects. Right? It only makes sense to do that in Java. But that can plug in, does plug in, is actually already one of the things that's quite advanced. It's being finalized to move over from generation one to generation two. But, but that's been proven that that can be, can be done. And you can have the brain working in a different fundamental language. So this means it can actually scale, like projects like Docker were able to do with their, their plugin. Um, uh, sorry, like Kubernetes were able to do with their plugin infrastructure, this can scale across communities. And that's really important, we think, for building the kind of multi, multi part and system framework that is um, at the moment just not, 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 not there in the, um, in the industry today. So that's, that's kind of like one, one deep live. And we're going to pull back up again now and we're going to talk, um, talk uh, a, a little bit differently um, about the um the ping pong the 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 relationship between all of this sort of pluggable architecture that is the node and the underlying technologies the umbrella of underlying technologies that plug in and we're gonna we're gonna think about a use case as simple as the one that andrew was showing earlier the the ping pong backwards and forwards of data and we're going to um look at what's the job that gets done from scratch in any kind of project today and how does Firefly help? And that I think will really help us then talk, as a, uh, talk about why the architecture of Firefly is the way it is, how it relates to, um, to things like blockchain and, and off-chain compute and deterministic compute and multi-party compute. Um, and, you know, some of you may have been thinking earlier, you're diminishing blockchain, you're, you know, you're making it just, just this sort of thin thing that you're, you're undervaluing it. Well, we value it so highly inside of the, the, the Firefly community of engineering. And um, I hope at the end of this sort of next section, you'll see why, why even for the simple cases, we need this kind of framework that Firefly is and how it does extend to a cases where you've got super advanced, sophisticated on-chain logic that is actually part of the, the system as well. So we're gonna make that transition now and um, we're gonna do it with um, a, a, a diagram we affectionately refer to as, um, as ping pong. Uh, I don't know if I can get rid of this. There we go, that's gone. So this 
diagram we're going to zoom into is showing what from a developer's perspective should be trivial. I assert this should be trivial. You come to blockchain and you want to do something meaningful. Inside of this diagram, we're showing not actually just what would need to be done inside of Firefly, but actually what would need to be done if you were building this from scratch. Three stages. We're showing I've got a, a digital asset, a piece of data. Maybe, maybe this is the scan of a diamond um, that is part of digital twinning it to an NFT. Maybe this is a document that's just been signed physically by somebody sitting in a port what, trying to get their boats to, to leave. I've, um, maybe this is a request for a proposal that I want to um, advertise to a whole, whole network. I've got one of these and I want to, I want to say that it exists to the whole community and, and um, I want to broadcast that out. And, and maybe some of that data can go directly onto the blockchain, but in most enterprise scenarios, we find that that's not always true, that there's at least some data that can't go onto the blockchain directly. So really simply, right? I want to write this document to the, doc, the blockchain. That's, we've had that said to us so many times. We know that's how it feels, right? I just want to put this document in the, in the blockchain. How do I do it? Well, um, that, that's sort of step, step one. And we'll talk through kind of what that really actually means for a poor developer today, like just starting from spare, spare principles. I want to like push that out to everybody, that broadcast button that, that Andrew did earlier. The next stage we're gonna look at um, is, right, well, I, I've seen that that thing over there, that organization, I know who they are, I've got their identity, they've proven that they have this thing, they've published enough data to me through a hash or real data or whatever it is that I know I want this. Um, I, I need to ask for it. I need to go to them and I need to say, well, you know, that, that scan of that diamond, you know, that matches up with my record. I know I've got that diamond. I, I want to ask you for this proof that you've got, the, this super detailed 100 megabyte um, uh, ultra fine scan of it. Right? I, want, I, want a copy of, I want a copy of that. Send it to me. Um, now, I, I, I probably don't want to tell everybody in the network that I'm making that request of you. And I definitely don't want to send any, any proof data, whether it's um, you know, some proof of authenticity that I have on my side that's going to allow you to authorize me to send you to send it to me. I, I don't want to put all of that somewhere that everyone else can see it. Um, and um, that, that, that means I probably want to send this to you as a sort of private exchange, but you still probably want to know it's from me. So surely what I just need to do is I need to send you a private message through the blockchain. Well, okay, that's that's great. How do you send a private message through the blockchain? Uh, and with all of the data, right, that, that needs to be aggregated together, maybe five different bits of data need to go with that message so that it comes across. And then that first organization that, that advertised that they have that that data to hand, they've got to look at what came across to them from this other organization. They've got to inspect it. They, it may be deterministic. It, it may be this super agreed process that everybody runs that's like, if you meet these criteria, then, then it, 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 you can respond. It, it may involve reaching into your own private backend data stores to make that decision. It may involve a human being looking at a queue and saying yes. Right. Let's not diminish how real that is in the kinds of um, business processes that we're trying to get from taking multiple weeks down to minutes in 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 in, in blockchain. Right. For for things things like um, post trade settlement and and all of these 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 processes with lots of documents flying about and UPS planes flying around the world. Right. There's human decision making involved in this. They need to authorize it. And then they're going to send the data back again um, to the other side. And, and in this example, 
that doesn't need to be pinned to the blockchain. It's just need to do that with really fast efficiency because blockchains, regardless of whether you're using um, a private blockchain or you're using um, a public blockchain and, and architecturally, although the focus in enterprise, um, which is kind of why we're focused there, but the focus in enterprise at the moment, the real world production adoption is in, in, the, in the permission chains. Um, but, but there's great evolution happening um, on the interlock with public chains, right? Um, but even in a permission chain, you're not talking about the same, the same you know, super super fast throughput because you've got to get agreement on that transaction from a set of parties. Even if it's a fabric channel and you've reduced the number of parties to a smaller number, you, it's still going to be something slightly more sophisticated than just pushing that data to somebody. So there are going to be cases where you want to do exchange where you don't even want to use the blockchain at all. I know. I know in a blockchain context in the multi-party system, that's a little bit hard to hear. Like, why wouldn't I pin everything? We're pragmatists. This project is about real world engineers being pragmatic and getting things solved. And yes, real enterprise projects have cases where they want to send data off chain between parties without pinning it to the blockchain. It's true. It happens. It's not something that certainly in this project that we that we think should be said like like that's that's wrong. You're 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 wrong because you want to do that. No, you understand your business process. You understand how it fits together. Yeah, that can, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay, so really we just talked about three super simple steps. I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna broadcast to the network some something. You're you're gonna see because you're part of the network that it exists. You're gonna send me a request. That's gonna be audited that you sent me the request. And I'm going to send you back some data. Let's look at what would be needed to do that from base principles. From base principles. Well, I want to pin it to the blockchain. Then um, what, what I what I need to do is I need an API inside of my application, right? I need a, my app is not blockchain. The app itself, the user experience, the mobile, the core integration with my backend systems that's unique to me, not everybody else in the network. That thing needs to be able to upload the data that's going to be pinned to the blockchain. It needs to be able to say, do it. That means it needs an API. And almost certainly, we found it's almost universally true, the amount of transformation that's needed of that data to get it sort of into the system means you want it to be stored in your own private storage. So you're gonna have a database that isn't your application core database. It's not the database of your ERP system that you built 30 years ago. This is a separate database that's for the blockchain, right? It's for this, it's for this multi-party system you're building. And you're going to have to transform, you know, code the data to get it there. So you can have a database inside of this, this thing. And then you're going to say, well, look, I want to broadcast this. But because it can't all go to the blockchain, you've got to actually take two separate actions. You've got to upload that, that data to somewhere that is suitable for the type of data you're uploading. It's a 100 megabyte payload. Where am I going to stick that? Um, and, um, and, and that means you need something like the proprietary file system that can be shared between everybody that isn't the blockchain, which is a place to put that data that's not doesn't, just, just doesn't fit the blockchain model. You're going to have a blockchain node, and you're going to work out, well, how do I do a blockchain transaction? And if you're starting from base principles, it doesn't matter which of the three communities you're in. If you're just starting from the raw interfaces, then you're, you're going to be there for a few weeks working out how to make just, just that work. So almost certainly, you, you're going to either build or take off the shelf. And that's why Firefly sort of integrates with um, and actually is, is embedded for the uh, Ethereum community, one of these already. And, and we're exploring the right thing to do with Fabric and, um, and Ethereum in terms of the relationship between these interfaces and the core Firefly. You're going to need an API that knows just how to do transactions on the blockchain, right? How do I do nonce management? How do I aggregate signatures from a whole bunch of people, assemble them together and work out the right thing to do to be able to submit the transaction if you're, you're in Fabric, right? You, so you could build that thousand lines of code yourself or, or for just for your project, or you could use something robust off the shelf. And then the, the other side, it gets even harder. That was the easy bit. That was the easy bit because you've now got two things that arrived separately. You've got to aggregate them together. So to aggregate them together. 
And um, this is actually one of the most important roles that we think in terms of wheel engineering that needs to be in a coordination system, an orchestrator. This is actually one of the most important roles of the project like Firefly can take on. You need to take things that arrive in different orders and assemble them together. In this particular case, it's actually reasonably straightforward with, with IPFS because it's going to come across the blockchain interface. You're going to detect it through events for the blockchain. Oh, just a minute. Blockchains don't have a nice interface for, for event listening in most, most cases that's like super easy for your web application written in TypeScript. So you're probably going to need a blockchain interface here as well. So again, Firefly is trying to onboard those and we have the production production ready one for for, for, um, for Ethereum and, and working on the other two there as well. So you're going to detect that it happened on the blockchain. And then you can go and fish for that data inside of IPFS. You can aggregate those together. Assuming everything was good, you can then dispatch that. And then you can actually call your logic. And now we're in, in what is the reality of any enterprise system. There's logic that's off chain. It isn't all of your logic that's off chain, but you wouldn't have an application if there wasn't logic off chain, right? Even, even CryptoKitties has off chain capabilities. It's, it, it's just the truth. There is off chain applications. And this thing has to have a great user experience. It's got to update. It's got to be suitable for business users. It's got to do integration at a business API layer with a, with, you know, a, a message bus um, that's integrating um, you know, as an ESB to your core, your core insurance system, your core healthcare system, right? This off-chain stuff is not trivial. It's really important. So you need to have the right, the right triggers coming out of the system into you, so you can do something. You can do something. And um, uh, in in this case, what we're doing is we're just saying in our application, right? Okay, I, I, I'm interested in that. I've made some calculated assessment that the publishing of that is something I'm interested in, I'm gonna request it. Well, at this point, more technologies come in because I'm gonna request it not through IPFS because that would be leaking all of my request data to everybody. Even if it's encrypted, that can be hard to justify from all kinds of regulatory perspectives. So, so probably what I wanna do is I wanna send that data privately to the one that the one place I'm sending it to is I'm responding to a request for a proposal and I'm gonna send my, my response. Well, that's a private exchange with just one organization to another organization. But if I want it to be audited that I did it at a certain period of time, maybe there's a race. Maybe there's a race and I have to do it before somebody else. Maybe only one person in the system can do this. Lots of data matching scenarios have that kind of race involved. Um, I need it to be pinned to the blockchain. So there's no ambiguity over the fact it came from me, it happened in a certain order, there's a global order with everybody in the system, even though the only people who have any ability, and in future sessions, we'll talk about all of the stuff we've done to mean that like the blockchain transactions are completely obfuscated. There's not even a link between like transaction one, two, and three on the same topic, don't even, have a, a link between them. So there's some great stuff that we'd love to talk in detail there, but wait, fundamentally, this is private exchange. You're pinning it to the blockchain. Whatever happens on the blockchain, even if it's more sophisticated logic, like there's some kind of coordinated transfer of an asset that's happening inside of that. In generation one, we have that built in, that's evolving for generation two. You're coordinating those together. You don't want it to be visible why you're doing it, you may not be willing for it to be visible who's involved, um, and you need to send the data somehow. So you need a data transfer tech, right? So suddenly every single multi-party system, as well as the blockchain network, has to build an off-chain transfer network. And that's got to be integrated in two. And you know, anyone who's been involved in, in, in one of these big enterprise multi-party systems will, will know for sure that this thing exists, right? It just, it just is there. It's in, in, in almost all of them that there's some way to transfer data peer-to-peer -peer between the organizations. So that, that's then more challenging on the data aggregation side because um, it comes into whatever that technology is. That's your, you know, your active MQR Artemis or, or, or whatever it is that you're, that you're, you're using Rabbit or, or whatever. Um, and um, probably you've got a layer of end-to-end -end encryption that's happening on side of there. That's certainly what in Collido we did. Um, Kafka is the technology that we chose to use inside of Collido for, for enterprise projects, which is 
which is um, just uh, we, we love it as a technology. So, um, uh, but but you know you, you've got this this runtime, right? You're gonna you're gonna be be working with that, whether it's centralized or decentralized, whatever it is, you've built it, you've got that there. Um, uh, and you're also gonna have your blockchain node, but these work in very different ways. Messages are gonna be batched and transmitted and arrive in completely different order to the blockchain node. You just cannot rely on those things happening in the same order and still have global ordering in the system. So one has to be king. And here's the magic. That's what blockchain can do, that no technology in the whole of my career in messaging and integration has ever been able to do. It's gold dust that blockchain can do this. There's one sequence. I guess it's in the name, blockchain, right? It's a chain of events. It sounds trivial, but it's magical, absolutely magical. We can all agree on one order of events. But because that order of events isn't the same order that the data are arrived, you need aggregation. So you've got to work out, well, how do I aggregate these together? If something, and this is the really hard bit that we've put a lot of engineering cycles into as a group. What if something doesn't arrive? How much of the world stops? Is the, does the whole world stop? I missed one packet of data. Do, can I not process anything from anybody anymore because I missed one piece of data? Can I not process anything from that? particular party because I didn't receive that data. Well, actually, the way a system should work, the way systems work outside of the multi party system blockchain space is you have like an ordering context, a topic and things on that topic are blocked, but things on other topics aren't blocked. Now doing that while preserving privacy and not leaking the same identifier into all the transactions that are on the same topic. While doing batching, because batching is an inevitability with these technologies, you have to batch, otherwise you can't get the throughput you need. That's suddenly a really hard problem. We've seen it implemented, we've implemented it many times over, and it's just not valuable for, for the world of of these systems to be implementing such heavy lifting, complex stuff over and over and over again. So we hope Firefly is going to be a place we can come together and get that right and take it away from the poor developers who are trying to meet project deadlines and solve, like, I just want to exchange data. So then we're now going to look at then at the final part. I've made some decision offline that says, yeah, I authorize it and I want to transfer data back again. Um, and in this particular case, it's just messaging. It's just messaging. Um, I just want to send the, um, the, the data. But here's the thing. I probably want to send multiple pieces together. I'm multiple steps into my business process. I've got 10 documents that have been signed along the way as part of this proposal by different people. Some of them came from me, some of them came from other people in the system, some of them were broadcast, some of them were private, I need to assemble them together. I wanna send not one packet of data, I wanna send a package from me to you. And that package is not just gonna involve tiny bits of data, it's gonna involve documents. So, and this isn't unique to blockchain for sure, um, but you've got this problem in this multi-party system where you don't just want to send one thing, you want to send multiple things. And some of them are big and some of them are small, some of them are blobs, some of them are structured data with schema, some of them are agreed canonical data formats. Surely that should be simple as a developer. Well, turns out, do it from base principles, it's not simple at all. You've got completely different transfer technologies that work in completely different ways. They arrive in completely different orders. Like if you've got a RabbitMQ message on its own, that's gonna arrive straight away like that. You do a 100 megabyte transfer, well, tens of thousands of messages um, on, the, on the, um, the, the event bus might arrive before that 100 megabyte transfer makes it through the large data transfer pipe. You know, managed file transfer is what we've tended to call it in the past to, to arrive there. So you still got the data aggregation problem on, on the receiving side in order just to deal with this. So, so I spent a bit of time on this one because I think it's really important to understand the, the, the types of problem that Firefly is there to solve. The fact that you won't find in Firefly super complicated 
um, smart contracts is not a sign that those aren't incredibly important and they don't fit the model. It's just that that's the innovation that we're embracing happening all over the place in the blockchain technology. But those communities that are building, you know, ERC20, my goodness, the years that it's taken, the trial by fire that it's taken to get that right, fantastic. It fits the model, bring it on board. We're not trying to reinvent that wheel. Firefly isn't trying to reinvent that wheel, but it is trying to say, as a developer, writing a web application, full stack, with a back end in TypeScript, with Node.js, I've spent my whole of my 10 year career getting fantastic at building enterprise software. I've been through the microservices revolution. I've been through Java Spring Boot, and I'm here. I want to use blockchain. I know how to use a database. Surely, in a day, I can do what I need to in blockchain. That needs to be true. That needs to be true. And we really hope, and through the lab today, you'll sort of feel it a little bit, that Firefly's there to make that true for you. And the architectural heavy lifting that we're doing, which is in the coordination layer, the orchestration layer between the on-chain and the off-chain, embraces non-deterministic logic, embraces manual business processes, embraces how hard it is to agree data formats and schemas between a whole bunch of people. The, the hours of meetings we've been in, like just talking about, are we, going to, are we going to spell address in our canonical format with address line one, two, and three, or with address as one line? And everyone's going to, like, that stuff, that's important. We need to spend the time there. The plumbing cannot be the be all and end all of these projects. Let's get it right. Let's make it available just as a commodity service to be used as part of building rich business function. That's the, that's the goal. And the plugin architecture is really important in the core to mean that this isn't just Golang source code that plugs in here. This is big projects. This is Hyperledger Avalon can plug in. This is all of Besu can plug in and all of Fabric can plug in and all of Corda can plug in. This is all of IPFS can plug in. This is Postgres can plug in, but also CouchDB can plug in. This is the five different messaging technologies, you know, NQTT based technologies can plug in and also like core enterprise messaging and QP based technologies can, can plug in. This is, I've got 10 different ways to write logic. Zero knowledge proof logic can plug in here. Off chain um, secured um, provable compute with trusted compute um, uh, frameworks uh, like SGX, et cetera, they can, they can plug in here. And great communities. We're, we're really good um, close links with a community called Node Red, which is about um, how do you build fast, um, really, really prove out event-driven programming models with an event-driven graphical interface, low code building of code, right? That kind of approach can now plug into blockchain. Almost every other industry is talking about, um, or technology sets talking about, you know, um, uh, pr process automation, automated process automation, and um, flow, right? And simple flow. And somehow, as of yet, in the multi party system blockchain space, we've not made it easy enough for flow engines to just be able to plug in on top of something. Now, Firefly right now today doesn't have that business flow engine inside of it. And that's a deliberate choice at this stage in the project because it, that overall modeling step um, that, you know, Composer started with that. This deliberately has started, what's it started with? The developer. The developer's experience matters is where this has started. But the idea is to allow that flow layer to then, then start to form on top. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, for the last five minutes of my session, before I hand over to Gabrielle, who's gonna bring this back, back down to earth for us, you're gonna see what you're actually gonna be running in a few minutes when you run through the, run through the lab. The last few minutes, I wanna just take um, a little bit of a step back and talk about the project as a, as a whole. And um, some of, you know, 
as an engineer inside of a group of engineers, there are there's there's things that you want to know. Like, is this a community that I sort of agree with? Is this a community that like matches how I feel about how things should be fitted together? Um, and and that evolves. That culture evolves with the community. But it's important, I think, if anybody's seeding a community to share. Like, what's their mindset when they're coming? They're coming in. Um, as we start this community building process. So I want to talk a little bit about, about this. Um, <clears throat> so we care passionately, passionately about blockchain and other multi-party system tech. We care passionately about it. We don't dismiss it. It's not just a time, time stamping service. We care passionately about it. And, and we agree that in any real world system, that um, making the ability to consume that logic easy for non-blockchain engineers through REST APIs, built-in patterns, built-in operations for common enterprise patterns, that's the way that you get success. Is not by not caring about the inside of the engine block that you care so passionately about, but by understanding that not everybody, when they consume this thing, is going to open up the engine block. I, I don't open up Postgres when I use it. I use Postgres all the time. I don't open up MongoDB when I use it. I use MongoDB all the time. That, that's, the, that's the kind of mindset, thinking about the sort of transaction um, layer. The data layer, data is going to be a mix of public and private. It's a reality for this project that that mix is there. That's core DNA. Process orchestration. We're really trying in this project, because we've done it with real world projects that we're working with directly. In seeding this, we're saying, yes, there's a lot of traction in just, you know, SDO projects in blockchain and other um, core projects where, there, where there's really proven on chain logic. But even in those projects, in an enterprise contract uh, uh, context, and in all of the other types of projects, in supply chain, and healthcare, and insurance, the list goes on. Um, the it's not just about tokens. There's lots of other use cases that are about process orchestration, multi-party process orchestration. We need to bridge these worlds together. So you, it really matters having an event-driven, an event-driven programming model that works for these other scenarios but not at the cost of losing things like digital assets, tokens, and NFTs building into the model. And actually, one of the reasons why that isn't right there today in Generation 2, even though there was a version of it in Generation 1, is we, we feel it's really important to get this one right, and that means more discussion. So there's, there's, a, there's a jump into this community. Like I said, Jim Zhang's leading it. We, we, we care really deeply about this one coming right. The fact it's not there today is not a reflection that we don't care about. It's actually how much we care about that one. And then the last pillar is to say identity really matters. But here's a really interesting thing about the enterprise use case. It's, there's two different types of identity that matter in any enterprise use case. There's the identity that's visible in transactions between organizations, that organizational identity. This organization signed off on this. This organization approves this because this other organization signed off on that. It's one type of identity. There's also another type of identity that is, here is inside of my organization, my 300,000 employees. They come. They go, they onboard, they offboard. We've built the processes for those. We've built the identity and access management systems, the Active Directory or whatever. We've, we've built that. It's not changing just because we're doing a blockchain project. The mapping of human beings in an enterprise context down to on-chain identity is not a one-to-one -one thing. So that's something that we care about in, in the project. And you'll see the start of a plugin for that um, and some great stuff in the, um, in the sort of the architecture side that started to think about it. And that's something where we've already started um, some great engagement with, with, with the community um, that's, that's forming here to try and work out what identity means in this, in this, in this context. So um, two more things in the last couple of minutes here that I want to say. 
um, and I promise then you'll, you'll stop needing to listen to me and you'll get your hands on some tech um, uh, as, as Gabriel's going to take you through. I, I wanted just to, to cover two more things really briefly. The one is, where the heck do I find the code? Right? Brilliant, you showed me where the samples are. Where's the actual code? Well, it's in Hyperledger. Um, currently, uh, the stage we're in the process is labs, and um, uh, there are a set of repositories. They're all prefixed with Firefly. So if you start at Hyperledger Labs slash Firefly, you'll find the first. And if you have a look at it, you'll find um, a little bit of an introduction to what it is, what it cares about, why it's around. Um, and this is actually the container of the core code, um, about 35,000 lines ago that's, that's in this core repository that's the main, the, main, um, the, the main brain of the system, the coordinator. But that's not to mean it's the most important piece, right? It's just, it's the bit that, that, that exposes the API and, and manages stuff together. So you'll then find a link off to a whole bunch of other repositories. The command line interface, that is so important, you'll be using it later, that means that anybody, blockchain or not, can start programming against Firefly in a couple of minutes. The UI Explorer, which um, you know, we put a lot of effort into, hats off to, to Alex and Brian and the team who've been seeding this, um, to, to really make it so that on day one, humans can use this thing. Human developers who haven't been in blockchain the whole time, don't think in hashes, can, can use this thing. Um, and, and, a, and a bootstrap for, for operational stuff as well. Um, a, a data exchange out of the box, which Gabrielle led the engineering on, um, which uh, performs mutual TLS-based transfer, which is where most projects have, have um, started. It's where Tesla, for example, are used for off-chain um, coordination. Um, but this is all very much about pluggability as well. Um, and um, uh, you know, we've proven the model with, as I said, with Kafka and end-to-end -end encrypted messaging in the past. Um, and then connectors for the blockchains, that's an evolving space. ETH Connect is another piece of um, really tried by fire engineering that we contributed um, from the Collider side to seed the project. Um, so that's become part of the, the Firefly family for Ethereum. Um, Corda, um, there's a lot of work that we've done um, that's evolving. The, merge, the moving across of that is happening at the moment. If you go to the repo, you'll only find part of it. But event streaming in Corda is something that we've done a really lot of work about as well as kind of building building a an ordered stream inside of Corda. It's not it's not not like a a block based system is is like core that you get out of the box in, in Corda with the UTXO model. So we built that on top and that's there as well. And then Fabric is just like fantastic um, space that you know, with people like Jim and Nick um, on the team who've been there since the inception of, of Fabric, it's something really dear to our hearts as a team. And we want to get it right. And it's such an active community that actually what's happening there is, um, is working with um, the Fabric Smart Client project to work out um, the, the right coordination between what logic goes where, how we, um, how we have the right um, uh, separation of concerns between the code that's being evolving, evolving between those, those two projects. So you'll find links to all of that, that stuff there. And then a whole load of detail on the architecture, including the sort of periodic table of elements. If you want to look inside of the code, you'll see um, the core broken down um, a little bit more. Um, we've assigned all of them a two-letter prefix. It gets used in the Go code. Um, in various places, um, and you'll see the core components, the network map, broadcast manager, the private messaging manager, the data manager, the event manager, the subscription manager, the asset manager, the batch manager, are all the core pieces of core, um, but then the really important stuff, right? The plugins, the blockchain interface, we even have a fake blockchain that, that, that's implemented inside of there as well, um, but Ethereum, core to fabric um, plugins, um, IPFS is the first plugin for the public storage interface, um, uh, HTTP direct um, uh, um, mutual TLS for the off-chain interface. Identity mapping at the moment, simple mapping of whatever's on-chain identity is your identity. identity uh, you know, the Ethereum address or the Corda certificate um, name or the Fabric certificate name, that is your identity, but this is a plug point for great things like DIDs, et cetera. Um, this one's still, still evolving, but external authentication, OAuth integration um, for that part of the authentication, which is mapping two keys. 
Um, the, um, so that's like the stage before you get to the identity interface. A database plugin, which at the moment we've done SQL first. Interestingly enough, the last generation did no SQL first. We've done SQL first. We'll talk about that in the, in, um, in the offline. And then the eventing interface, where we started with WebSockets, because it's so great for developers. It's just what de where developers live nowadays. So we started there. There's way more coming, coming um, uh, here that we've already got in the works. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now, and I'm going to hand over to Gabrielle, who's going to um, bring us back down to earth, and we're going to talk about um, the um, what you're going to be doing and seeing for real in, in your lab. And Peter, before you transition, I, there's just a question um, in the chat here that I thought maybe there's some nuance to, so I wanted to, to raise it to you. Uh, Luis said, you showed we could send data privately off-chain, from org one to org two naive question doesn't that mix with fabric multiple channels and private data oh, that is an absolutely great question so we believe from experience that they're complementary that they're complementary and there's actually a construct inside of the firefly core model called a ledger um, which is designed and intended to map to things like, what's the scope of who validates my transactions? That's the, the channel model. What we've seen is that there are cases where you have data that for whatever reason, doesn't actually fit a blockchain at all. Doesn't matter how much you restrict the parties, it doesn't fit the blockchain. Or, and this is a really interesting one, there's data where you need to prove and have proof with a larger set of parties that have visibility of the data. So the channel might include the supplier and the purchaser and an auditor, but the visibility of the data that goes between the supplier and the purchaser might be different to the data that goes between the supplier and the auditor, different that goes between the auditor and the purchaser but they might all want to see the same events in the same order on the same channel. Um, and, and you just got the practical problem. If I want to send a one gigabyte file, am I going to send that through a channel with the on-chain data? Probably not. That's probably going to be an off-chain transfer. Am I going to send a scan of somebody's passport on a blockchain? Well, maybe I'm going to be thinking the benefit of blockchain is it's immutable and I'm never going to be able to delete this thing. Does that, does that fit? If I put it on a blockchain where I have to delete the whole blockchain if I want to delete that data? Um, maybe it's just easier. Maybe it's going to save me a year of regulatory pain to not put it on the blockchain directly and to pin it to the blockchain. So we, we embrace the, the, um, the synergy between the, two, the sets of privacy. Um, in a session earlier in the week, actually, Jim went through the different versions of privacy that exist. And it's only a 15-minute 15, 15 segment, um, and then we do an intro to Firefly afterwards. You might want to listen back to that, because um, they, they, they fit. They fit together. They're, they're great Lego bricks that you can use to build your enterprise system. And, and all Firefly is trying to do is to say you should have access to all the Lego bricks. It's not trying to say this Lego brick's better than that Lego brick. It's just saying there's a reason why there's different shaped Lego bricks. Um, and when you're building your solution, you should be able to fit them together in the way that's actually going to give you the velocity that your business goals need. So hopefully that answered the question a, a little bit there. Yes. And actually, while you're talking, Peter, do we had a second question come in, which I think is a pretty uh, similar vein, asking about support for Tessera and other potential enterprise layer two solutions. And Tessera, of course, is the private uh, off-chain mechanism that sort of comes in the box uh, in Ethereum and in Quorum uh, and Besu. Another great question. Um, so, so right now today, Generation 2 Firefly code does not have an implementation of a, um, uh, a, you know, a core integration of Tesla. However, 
the blockchain plugin that partners with it, which is um, Firefly ETH Connect, has direct integration with, with um, the Tessera and EEA private transaction model built in at that layer. And um, the glue needed to just make that linkage work is trivial. There's an interesting thing with Tessera of does it fit more as a plugin as this ledger concept like a channel does, or does it just plug in underneath the blockchain interface? And that's something that I've personally been thinking a bit about, and I'm looking forward to that conversation in one of the upcoming architecture sessions. Um, and, and hopefully that's a great area where we can have a contribution um, because um, that that is a, you know, in the in the framework, we actually think that's a pretty easy one to solve. Pretty easy one to solve. So that would be a great area to to start bridging, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 the the communities here. And we're great friends, right? The um, the, the, the 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 team in Besu and the, and the team in Collider, me personally and Wilbur and others have been working together for so many years. I think we can just make that one happen so so quickly.